Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road, and we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays, and we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. Have you ever read scripture, especially the Gospels, especially the stories of Jesus, and just wished or imagined for a moment, what would it have been like to be able to walk in the dust of the rabbi, to step into the pages of scripture, to see with our own eyes the miracles and the works of the one who is fully God and fully man, Christ, God incarnate. I think as I think about today's passage that we're going to be in, today we're going to be in, in Matthew chapter 9, picking up in verse 35, and you can turn there this morning. But a little bit of context. This is an interesting part of Matthew's account of the Gospels. And Matthew is very much concerned as he writes with telling the story of Jesus, the promised Messiah, the one who came from the line of David, the one who the prophets foretold, and he is Jesus, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And he is showing both the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus. And in this passage that we're going to look at today, it comes right after this litany of miracles. If you look at Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9, you have actually one of the most rapid-fired, condensed number of miracles that happen in any two chapters in the Gospels. Here's just a few things that happened. Matthew 8 opens with Jesus cleansing the leper. It goes on in that same chapter, and he heals the paralyzed servant of a centurion. He actually tells him that the centurion comes to Jesus with his faith, and he sends him back and tells him that your servant as well. Jesus doesn't even go to the centurion's house and he brings healing to him. Matthew recounts that Jesus was at Peter's house and uh, there were many healed, including Peter's mother-in-law. We also have in Matthew, in Matthew 8, there are two men with uh, demons who are freed and liberated. Matthew 9 opens with the healing of a paralytic. You also have the young girl, the dead daughter, who's brought back to life. You have the woman with the issue of blood who reaches out and touches the hem of the garment of Jesus and is brought into healing. And then in Matthew 9, 27, you have blind men who are also healed. All that in the course of just two chapters. And I skipped over other miracles, Jesus calming the seas in that very same chapter. So Matthew is obviously very concerned with showing the miracle worker, Jesus, the one who is bringing healing it ends with this, Matthew 9, 33. Never was there anything like this seen in all of Israel. This was unprecedented. The God of mercy meets so many people in their physical ailments. Jesus demonstrates his divine power over creation, the powers of the world. And Matthew is unpacking this supernatural healing, building and building into a crescendo. This is like an action movie, right? It is like action upon action upon action. And then we get to our passage today, and it's actually this moment. And if you love movies, you know that moment where all of a sudden the music slows, right? And the main character kind of steps forward to the screen, and the shot comes in tight. And it's this moment of reflection. After all of this activity, after all of this action, Jesus is going to bring this kind of to a close with a reflection. And that's where we pick up today in Matthew 9, and we're going to pick up in verse 35. This is what the word of the Lord says today. We'll start, we'll read the whole section that we're going to explore today. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Um, you may have a different version, but it'll track along. And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. So that's like the recap statement. That's sort of the summary, all right? The cliff notes of what's happened. Jesus is going from synagogue to synagogue, from city to city. He is teaching and he is bringing healing, every type of disease and affliction. And then the music slows. And this is what Jesus says. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. The way of Jesus at every single turn of his story is that when others move away from need, what direction does Jesus move? He moves towards need. And we see that first in physical need, physical healing. And Jesus is concerned with our physical bodies. We're not just earth suits with a disembodied soul. We are mind, body, and soul. So God, in, in his providence, first demonstrates that need. And if you're here today and you have physical ailments, I can't promise you the healing that God will heal you, but I promise you this, he can. And you can pray to him that he will bring healing to you. But at the same time that Jesus is concerned with the physical body, the thing that we notice here is that he looks upon the crowd and this word that he has, he has compassion on them. Why? Not just because they're the sick without a doctor, but because they are like sheep without a shepherd. They are lost. He sees the people who are lost. That is what moves the heart of God to compassion. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. It moved him to his soul because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. Friends, as, as followers of Jesus, if you're here today and you know Jesus, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, if you come to faith in him, then it is important for us as, as people who have been transformed that we look at what are the things that burden the heart of God? What are the things that bothered Jesus? What are the things that move the heart of Jesus to compassion? Because as we grow slowly in the likeness of Christ, the things that bother Jesus should be the things that bother us. The things that we see that are important to the way that Jesus lived are things that should be important to us. We need to practice the way of Jesus. And what that means is to see the way that he sees. And this is what he sees. See what he sees, a perspective of Christ-like compassion, a perspective of Christ-like compassion. I grew up in a, a small New England town, not too far from here. I see Aaron uh, in the back. We grew up in the same town. I went to school with her sister uh, that right down in Winston, Mass. And I tell this story when I travel all over the Northeast, and most people have no idea where that is. So you guys are a little different. And when I describe growing up in a small town in New England, the way that I can kind of drive that home is I have one way to tell. It's not how many people live there. It's not that we didn't have a street light. It's not that how few kids were in my graduating class. It's this, and this gets people every time. When I grew up, my hometown did not have a Dunkin' Donuts. All right. That you know right there. It does now. But at the time, it did not have a Dunkin' Donuts. When people hear that, they're like, I didn't know that, that existed. Uh, and, uh, but we were, I grew up in a, a small, normal New England church, not much unlike this church. It was you know, maybe 50 to 80 people, depending on you know, Easter. Maybe we hit 100 people. That would be amazing. And my mom and dad were uh, very involved in our, our little church. You know, you've heard the statement that we were at the church when the doors were open. Well, we shoveled the sidewalk and opened the doors of the church. That was my family. And uh, my parents, they never took a check from the church. They were always volunteers. They were Sunday school teachers. They were Awana leaders. They did all the different things in the church. My dad served as an elder and would preach and fill in for our pastor at times. Um, and it was a really, really incredible thing. And when I came to faith in Christ, somewhere between 8 and 10 years old, I got baptized. Um, they pulled me aside and they said, Andy, uh, you've been here for a while. And you're now part of the team. You've made your profession of faith in Christ. And uh, you need to start carrying your weight around here. Uh, we need to give you a job. And so I, my first ministry uh, is was uh, I was the director of overhead transparencies. That was my first job at about the ripe old age of 11. And uh, I don't know. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But somewhere between the, the hymnal and the digital projector, there was this uh, middle ages, the dark ages of the overhead projector where we had these, they were, never really looked that great and they were always hard to move around. It was much harder than most people give me credit for, but I was the original PowerPoint. All right, that was me. And uh, it was a, a really good thing. I graduated eventually to be the sound guy and, and went on from there. And uh, here's the thing, here's why I share that. Because one of the things that my parents gave me as a gift, and if you're here today and you're a parent, this is one of the things you can give your children as a gift, is that church, was not just a place that we went. It's not a building. It's not a location. Church was a people. Church was a people joining in God's mission. We were together in God's mission. And that was woven inseparably into my life to the point where today, that's still what I get to do. Now, I actually get paid for it, which is kind of nice. Uh, but that was the thing is that church was a spiritual family 
that was together joining in the mission of God. And that is such a beautiful and powerful thing that God gave me. And later on in life, and I won't spare you all the details, but we ended up going to Jaffrey Bible Church where Peter and Jared are today. And I was a part of youth group with, with Jared and with his siblings. And God did a great work there. And Peter was the first one who, when I knew one and a half guitar chords, uh, he said, you are a worship leader. And I said, no, I'm not. And uh, he said, yes, you are. And uh, those, those people that spoke into me and the opportunities I have really informed my life. And I believe in the mission of God through the local church with all of my heart. I'll share a little bit more today, some of the ways that I get to do that now. But when you spend your whole life somewhere, I'm, I'm born and raised in New England. I've lived here all my life in the Northeast. And the thing is, you have to be honest, though. I love the church. I believe wholeheartedly in it. I give my life to serve it. But we need to be honest about the good and the bad. You have to come with grips with there's, there's incredible beauty in the community of faith. At the same time, we are sometimes a jacked up, dysfunctional family of faith. Are we not, right? That is who we are. And it's the moment you walk into church, it's imperfect, right? The moment you show up, church ceases to be perfect. That's true for me and that's true for you. And God is not threatened by our imperfections. That's the good news. He knows we have a perfect father. The head of the church is perfect. All of us, not so much, right? We are, ceasing, we are saved by grace and we are, are seeking day by day to live more in the pattern of Jesus. But one of the things I recall about growing up in New England is this phrase, and you probably heard this phrase too, but I remember from the time I was very little, I heard this thing said about New England Christians, and it was this, that we are the frozen chosen, right? Some of you have heard that? That's right. I heard that from the time I was very young. And it, there's kind of a funny part to that. And, and I think there's, there's a, a, under, a part of that that I, I understand, right? I understand the truth of the fact that this can be a really hard place to be a Christian. You're, you are not, you are going countercultural when you walk into your school or your workplace and you say that you are a Jesus follower. That is 100% true. And it's, it's, you know, I've heard it said it's rocky soil and it's difficult. And churches are not massive for the most part. Um, and so there is a truth that we live in a very post-Christian place, all right? And um, there's uniqueness to that. But I think that if we're not careful, we can forget that we have everything that we need. Everything that we need. We don't need bigger buildings or bigger budgets because we have the provision of Jesus Christ himself crucified and resurrected. We have the spirit of the living God. A number of years ago, I read a book called When Helping Hurts. And the thesis of this book and the authors that wrote it was looking at the idea of global poverty those who are impoverished around the world. And primarily it's focused in looking at physical poverty, people who do not have enough sustenance, lacking medical care or housing. And it talked about this reality, sort of the main thesis of the entire book is built around this thing that as Westerners, as people, especially from the United States, when we look at poverty, whether that's poverty in the city nearby, or if it's in Haiti or somewhere along the, around the world, that we predominantly look, our lens, and just naturally, is that we look at poverty through a lack of material provision, right? So our inclination, our first instinct predominantly is to think about somebody's hungry, they need food, right? Somebody is lacking shelter, they need, let's build them a home, let's build a school, let's provide for them the medical care that they need. And those are good things. And if you've been involved in those things, this is not a, a message against that. But the thing that they kind of uncovered is that sometimes we overlook the reality that underneath those presenting issues, those symptoms that kind of show up on the surface is the reality that there is a spiritual and emotional component to poverty. They interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the world. And they found this through line that went throughout that many people who are in poverty, there's a reason there's generational poverty. There's a reason that certain countries and areas of the world seem like they're captive to poverty. It's because there's a spiritual and emotional stronghold in the hearts and the minds of the people that they think that they are poor. Therefore, they will always be poor. And when I read that, I certainly applied it to the physical world. But when I read that, I realized, especially thinking about growing up here and hearing about the frozen chosen, that that is so often how we think about the church here in New England, that there can be a spiritual and an emotional stronghold in us. And what I call I what I call it is the spiritual poverty mindset that we believe that because we are poor in spirit, therefore, we will always be poor, that we believe because we may not see many people responding to the gospel, that no one will respond to the gospel. 
We think that this is a God forsaken area. Friends, there are no God forsaken areas, just like there are no God forsaken people on this side of eternity. And that is such an important thing for us to remember. In Jesus, in the spirit of the living God, you and I have everything that we need. And we need to remember this truth. If you're a Jesus follower today, this is your story, right? We live in the land of the great awakening and God could do that again. We should believe that with all of our hearts. But even if he doesn't, one thing you and I can say for sure with all of our heart is that God has done a great awakening in our hearts. He has taken what was dead in sin and shame, and he has made it alive together with Christ. He has taken the penalty of our sin upon himself fully and freely. We've sung about it this morning. And Ephesians 2 tells us that we are now raised with Christ and seated with him, not someday, but now in the spiritual, in the heavenly places. And that is your story. And that is my story. And what this means, the implications of this are that your neighbor, that grumpy New England neighbor, you know the one. You all thought of somebody. They're a prime candidate for transformation by Jesus. That coworker that drives you crazy, that may even make your faith difficult, they are not beyond the reach of God. They are not beyond the reach of God. And your family, some of those even who live under your own roof, who may be pushing back against the faith that you hold, God could do a work in their life. It's not over. It's not over. And what this requires for you and me is to see as Jesus sees. To look at our world. It's easy to see the brokenness of our world. It's everywhere. It's overwhelming. And we, could, we do need to stand for the truth of God's word. There's no compromise in what I'm saying here. But at the same time, Jesus did not look at the crowd with condemnation. He looked at the crowd with compassion. He looked at them and said, these people are lost and without a shepherd. They need a shepherd. They need the good shepherd. And we need to stop hiding from the darkness and trying to build citadels that we hide from the world. And we need to go out and carry the light to a, a lost and dying world, to people who are desperate for hope. It's time to stop yelling at the darkness and carry the light of God into those cold, dark places. Friends, you're not the frozen chosen. You're the chosen. You're the chosen. You are God's provision for this region. And it's time for us to see our neighbors, our neighborhoods, our communities, and our region the way that Jesus does. He looks at us and he has compassion. I want to show you a short video if you can check out the screen. What does God see when he looks at New England? 473 miles of coastline, harbors and capes, bays and beaches, inlets and islands, mountains green and white, granite majesty dressed with maple, oak and pine, streams forming rivers feeding lakes, the August heat and autumn colors, the winter snow and the spring of life. What does God see? The craftsman sees his creation. We call them Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, cobblestone city streets and postcard worthy rural roads. Mill towns and main streets, white churches on the town green, ringing bells forged by Paul Revere himself. Bangor, Burlington, Boston, Rotten, Dogstown, Gardner, Windsor, Ware, and Worcester. What does God see? Neighborhoods and neighbors, farmers and fishermen. Innovators and educators, natives, townies, and immigrants, a melting pot, they say. Children, millennials, veterans, retirees, and, and everything in between. What does God see? He sees dust filled with his very breath. He sees souls. 
Scripture reminds us that God does not see as we do. He does not look merely to the external and the obvious. God looks to the very heart. And we who believe are his adopted children, redeemed by his sacrifice, Christ's cross and empty tomb, redeeming our past, reshaping our present, and securing our future. What does God see? What if we saw as God sees? What if we prayed as if God heard and answered our prayers? What if we worship like we say we believe and sang like he was the only audience that mattered? What if we loved as God first loved us? Would the world change? Would New England change? Would I change? Verse 37, Matthew 9. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. Jesus sees with compassion, but he also sees a plentiful harvest, a place in villages ripe for revival, ready for spiritual harvest. We need not only to see what Jesus sees, we need to seek what Jesus seeks, a priority of earnest prayer for workers. I want to encourage us today to be people who pray for God to send out workers. This is one of the things Jesus didn't ask us to pray for a lot. There are things that Jesus asked us to pray for, but this is one of a few of them to pray for workers. The harvest is plentiful. There's so much potential, unlimited opportunity. But the problem is this, that the workers are few. Jesus is saying everywhere I go, I see people ready for rescue. It's not a shortage of need. It's not that people far from God will never want God. It's not a lack of opportunity. It's a lack of laborers. Friends, the kingdom of God does not have a lack of opportunity. The harvest is plentiful. It is the workers that are few. And so Jesus instructs us. What does he tell us to do? Work harder? No, he doesn't say work harder. Do more? No, he doesn't say do more. He says what? He says pray Pray, intercede before God to bring workers. Ask the God of heaven and earth, the miracle working God, the one that just performed all of these miracles, that has shown his dominion over all of creation, over every human body, over every human soul, over even the wind. Pray to that God that he would raise up and bring forward generations of people who do not merely put their identity in the idea of Christianity, but who apprentice in the way of Jesus fully devoted disciples, activating, on mission, going, and seeing the fulfillment of the Great Commission in their very midst. This is good news for you and for me. But friends, we need to pray. You are known as good news. That is the name of your church. The sign is on the street. I've seen it. And you need to be people of the good news who are dedicated to be people of prayer. People of prayer for workers. Uh, a few people asked me today, so what, so what do you do for work? What do you do for work? And uh, it's really funny in my work, and I'll explain it in just a minute. It's really fun to explain that to people who have no Christian worldview. Uh, so that's, uh, but anyway, I'm sort of like a pastor, but I help a whole bunch of churches. That's the simplest way I describe it. So, but I, I talk to my friends who don't know Jesus. They're like, oh, so you work for the diocese. I was like, sort of, not exactly, but different and very different. Uh, so anyway, I work for a network of churches called Converge Northeast. It is a, basically, I joke that we're the non-denominational denomination. All right. So our churches are all independent churches, local churches all over New England in Eastern New York and New York City. There's 10 districts around the country, but I work for the Northeast region and we just help support. So we strengthen existing churches, come alongside pastors, build relationships, provide resources, we have you know different benefits the churches who are part of our network get to take part in uh, and then we also plant churches and i actually have a predominant 
focus of mine is in church planting. And so in just a couple of weeks, I'll be taking some church planters to our assessment center to see if we're going to start some new churches in, in the Northeast, which is awesome. When I started this job about two years ago, um, you know, I thought, man, there's going to be a lot of hard things. Like we don't, our network is sort of on the rise and it's growing, but I don't have a lot of systems. I it was a new job. So like, it wasn't like somebody hold, handed me a folder and said, here's the playbook, right? It was kind of like, good luck. You know, that was that kind of thing. And so I was like, man, there's going to be a lot of things I got to figure out. I got to figure out how to raise money for this. I got to figure out how to, you know, coach these young church planters. Well, all the problems in different, different parts of the, we you know, and the thing that I didn't really realize that would be the hardest was simply this finding pastors and church planters. That is the most difficult thing. And I thought maybe I was a little crazy. So I started to talk to people from other networks and other parts of the country and friends, I just want to tell you today, this is a sobering reality that we are in a world of hurt when it comes to the next generation of pastors and church planners. This is a theme that is running all over our country. We are rapidly facing a growing crisis in the church of the United States. If nothing changes, we will not have enough pastors to lead existing churches and enough planters to start new ones. And why do we need to start new churches? Because there's places and people who do not know about Jesus there are, there are communities in New England that qualify as unreached people groups by international mission standards. There are so few Christians in those towns. And churches are closing every year. So we need to plant churches just to keep at zero, just to stay level with how many churches that we have. We don't need fewer churches. We need more churches. But the problem that we have is this. We're not going to have enough workers. If we don't, this is why we need to pray. This is a sobering reality. I want to give you a few data points, some research. Barna has been tracking the health of pastors over the last couple of decades. And there's a few different things, but here's, here's one today in the U S there are more pastors over 65 than under 40. So if you took all the pastors and you said, all of you are over 65, all of you are under 40, it would be way more over 65. Now we're, we need to keep going with like, we're not saying like, if you're 65, you're done. That's not the message here at all today, but it is a sobering reality because those 40 year olds are soon going to be 65. I'm one of them. All right. In the past 30 years, listen to this. In the past 30 years, the average age of a pastor has increased. In, in 1992, all right, the average age of a pastor in America was 44 years old. All right. By the year 2000, just eight years later, the average age of a pastor in the United States had risen to 50. Today, it's 57 years old. So we have seen and over 13 year increase in the average age of a, of a pastor. Barna also tells us that by the year 2030, which is getting closer by the day, one out of every four, so 25% of the current pastors will be retired. A, a whole quarter. Never mind those that are leaving for different reasons. There's a whole other, bunch of other things I could tell you. I talk to seminary leaders all the time. Enrollment is down. There are fewer people going off to seminary than ever before. 15 years ago, our church near Boston was looking for a new lead pastor. We had over 500 resumes flood the office. I'd say a hundred of them were qualified candidates. And um, today we see healthy churches that are well-established, that have resources to take care of a pastor. And some of them are seeing less than a dozen resumes. And then they're competing against churches in Arkansas where a house costs $20,000. Now it's a little exaggeration, right? But we're up here in the Northeast and the cost of living is high. We don't have the resources. Again, these are realities, right? It's not excuses, but these are realities. We cannot afford, I want to tell you this, we cannot afford to buy free agents as the next generation of pastors. We have to take on the mandate to pray and to build them ourselves. It is going to be incumbent upon every local church to be a community of faith that is raising up local leaders. They're in your nursery. They're in your Sunday school classes. They are here, but it is our job together to surround them with steadfast prayer and to invest in the next generation. One of the things that I get to do with Converge is I lead a, a cohort, a gathering of eight early to mid-career pastors. So these are men who are in their first or second decade of pastoral ministry. The reason we started this is because what we were seeing was we would see young men come forward into ministry and then leave about the time that they were about a decade in. They would go off and sell real estate or go into a different, because it just was not good for their souls to be in ministry. Now, not everybody who is in ministry just for a season is a tragedy, all right? I don't think it's like a lifelong sentence to be in full-time ministry, right? 
But for many, the, there are people that should be in ministry for the long haul that aren't staying in it. And that's a problem. And so we built this cohort and we gathered eight leaders and we do a retreat in the fall, a retreat in the spring. And then we meet once a month for a full day, every single month. And we're talking about the spiritual formation of the actual leader, not just their output, not just what they do for God, but who are they in God? Because one of the most dangerous places for your soul is actually full-time ministry because you spend your days doing things for God. And sometimes it's easy to drift from being with God in that. So we invest in those things. And we were on this, this uh, group retreat this last fall. We were out in Western Massachusetts, out in the Berkshires. Uh, we were out at, there's a camp out there called Hume. And we were doing the retreat there. It was a midweek. We were using their property. And um, great place to get away in the Berkshires. Beautiful fall, like peak foliage time, right? The right, best time to be out in Western Massachusetts. And um, we're there together. And part of the experience that we do together is we go on a hike. And so we dragged these guys. Some of them loved it. Some of them are still uh, recovering from it. But we went on a seven-mile hike as part of the – we hiked part of the Adirondack Trail. And I had to remind some of them. I'm like, you know, people start this in Georgia, all right? And they, <laughs> they come all – we're only doing like four or five hours. So we're going to be okay. But we did this hike, and it's great time. You know, so much of Jesus' life, if you look at it, is actually just walking and talking with people. And sometimes we don't have that because we're always on our devices or doing other things. So it's beautiful and powerful time. And then we were headed back to camp after doing this hike. And we were driving through the town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. I don't know how many of you know where Great Barrington is, but it's about an hour west of Springfield. It's where like Tanglewood is, beautiful Western Mass. And it's a really interesting town because it kind of has both that like uh, kitschy, artsy New England part of it. And then and a lot of old money out there, people retire. And then there's a lot of rural poor. It's a really, and it's sort of classic New England regional city too. Population's not huge, but a lot of people do their commerce and come to Great Barrington to do their work in commerce. And, and um, we've been praying that there would be a new church plant in Great Barrington. In fact, we have a couple of churches that have said, we will help support with significant resources, a new church in Great Barrington. But what we don't have it's a church planner. So we stopped and we looked up on a map and I said, hey, let's pick this park. We'll go to, I've never, I actually never been to Great Barrington. So I just picked on Google Maps. We went to this park and I think we have a picture of us uh, here, us gathered around by the river. And we gathered, this is our group here. The camp van is parked by the side of the road. And, and we're just there and we shared the vision of the story. Honestly, I was hoping that one of them would get like the spirit of God would fall in that moment. And they'd be like, this is where I need to come church, plant a church. Did not happen. But God had something else in mind that day. So we prayed earnestly and the prayers were so beautiful because we know like any city, there's a remnant, right? There's a few gospel churches that are, are fledgling and struggling out there, but there's a remnant of people who are just de like desperate to have a spiritual community. They are desperate for that. And so we just prayed, God, that you would, one, you're already working here. Would you raise up the remnant? Would you, we prayed against the powers of darkness because there's a lot of new age and spirituality in Great Barrington. There are strongholds there that God is going to have to work through. And we just prayed earnestly, God, Jesus, send us a worker. And we opened our eyes and all of a sudden there was another guy sitting in our circle. And if you're in New England, like if you're praying, which is already weird in public, and then somebody shows up, you're like, how weird is this going to get, right? Is this person here with the, like, what are they going to do? And so he introduced himself. And I have a picture of Gene. This is Gene. Gene comes over and he said, hey, I saw, the, I saw you guys praying, which is bizarre enough in Great Barrington. And I saw the camp van. I've heard of this camp. And are you guys from the camp? And we said, no, we're actually pastors from all over New England. And he said, oh, well, what are you guys doing? And he said, well, I, we told him, we said, well, we're praying for there to be a new church here. We're praying for there to be a new gospel outpost. And we're praying that God would raise up a worker to lead this. And Gene looked at us and you could kind of see his eyes already starting to get wet. And he said, that's really interesting. I'm one of the elders at Calvary Bible Chapel on the edges of town. We're a church that we've had brighter days before, but we're down to just a real small group of people now. We don't even have a paid pastor at this point. In fact, people come and go. And so we're actually meeting tonight to decide whether or not to close the church. We said, Gene, can we pray with you? So we prayed with Gene that God would give them discernment 
and wisdom. You know, Calvary Bible Church may not be the answer for Great Barrington, but the Big C Church of Jesus Christ definitely is. Our brands and our logos, our egos, those things need to be set aside. And as we swapped information with them, and there's a lot more to the story that I can't even share with you about other things that are happening there. There are two dying churches that are getting together to have a final baptism service because somebody came to know Jesus before they closed their doors. But you know what is crazy to me? All this is happening. The spirit of God is definitely moving. He is, he is leading us there, but we need to, I need your prayers. I need you to pray with me because we need a pastor for Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And friends, that's just one story of one community, of one community in all of the Northeast. We need to see like Jesus sees, and we need to seek what Jesus seeks. And then finally, and this is the rest of the story, and I encourage you to go home today and read chapter 10, because we seek what Jesus seeks, and then we do what? We send as Jesus sent. That maybe the new measure of success is not how many seats are full, but how many people we send out. Send out to the marketplace, send out to your workplace, and send out to the mission field, whether that's across the world or if it's just across Massachusetts. That we need to send as Jesus sends. Jesus encourages us to do that. Some of you remember, or may, may or may not, but I was here somewhere around a year ago. We were trying to remember what it was. But that sermon, I was talking about what it was like to be a tree planted by streams of living water. And that the mark of a life in God is that the two things that mark our success is faithfulness and fruitfulness. That those two words mark it. And I, I shared the story about the apple tree in my front yard. And if you weren't here, that's okay. I'll fill you in on it. But we talked about that last time, that this question of what is fruit for? What is the fruit of our lives? And I'd say today, what is the fruit of our church? What is it for? And what we said there is that the fruit of our lives and the fruit of our church is for the benefit of others. That a, the apple on the tree is not for the tree. It's actually for the benefit of other people. And it's for multiplication. It's for the benefit. That is what fruit is for. And I, what I want to close with today is this simple thought that perhaps the most valuable part of the, the sweetest part of the fruit is definitely when you bite in, right? We all love that. But what is the most valuable part of the fruit? The most valuable part of the fruit, I'll try not to slice my hand here in front of you. The most valuable part of the fruit is the seed. And the thing is, if you have ever, I don't have a green thumb, so this is even more true for me. But I want to say this to you as a church. It is not your responsibility to grow every tree. But it is your responsibility to plant seeds of faithfulness. It is our responsibility. And did you know from one apple, there are five to eight seeds in every apple. How many apples could be produced from one? The problem is it's slow. It's a lot like the way that Jesus works. It's slow. It takes time. But if we are faithful, if we look around and see all the riches that we do have, when you, one of the riches that you have are the children that are in your church and the young people. If you take time and sow into those seeds, God is going to raise up. And I believe this. If each of us will take that heart, every church will take that perspective that God will raise up for us, not just a tree to plant more tree, uh, plant more fruit, to grow more fruit, but God will raise up for us an orchard of the gospel in New England. That generations will change because of our ordinary faithfulness and our sincere prayers that God would raise up the workers for the harvest. That is your challenge and that is mine. Friends, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Let's pray to the Lord of the harvest. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for the gift of today. We thank you for the reminder of your word. God, we thank you that we get to gather here. I also just want to celebrate today what's happening in Jaffrey. This is a seed planted that Peter's ministry, the ministry of this church, you invested so much into Jared and Allie over the years that even though that tree is in a different city now, that we get to share in the fruit and the faithfulness of that life and the more that will be raised up because of it. And God, we celebrate that and we thank you for that. We celebrate with Jared and Allie and the Vitello family, the ordination of Jared.
And God, we pray that you would raise up more workers for Great Barrington, for all the communities, for this church in the future, that we would all be contributing to the work. And God, give us that eyes to this week. I pray that we would see our neighbors, our coworkers, our family with the eyes of Jesus and have fervent prayers for their salvation. It is in your great name, the matchless name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.